Thank you. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, as promised and as I've advertised, you have the very first question. Thank you. Juanita, you have achievements in arts, in management, and in education. You have achievements as part of a career or careers and as a volunteer and you have used your talents on the whole spectrum from purely secular to purely religious. My question to you is, where, what is the role religion has played in all of these things? In response to you, you are the reason that I am here because you have been the wind beneath my wings. You have supported me in all the things that I have wanted to do uh, since I decided to stop working for pay. <laughs> and religion is in my heart. And I just said to someone that I live so that my cup is half full, not half empty. So I am ready because I reach out and I feel so good when I can bring a smile to someone's face and they keep smiling and it just makes me feel so special. But religion, I've discovered, has been in my heart. Years ago, I didn't realize that. My mother had me singing in public when I was five years old, singing to a big church. And um, I've been singing ever since. And I grew up with classical music because she was a classical pianist. Now I have to clean up my act a little bit because my husband has become a pastor. And so I sang the role of Carmen in the opera. And so I have to really straighten out my life a little bit. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Now, John, do you have a follow-up to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have other questions I'll ask later. Okay. <laughs> we actually have questions that have been emailed to us. This is a first. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Vanham. He says, sounds like fun. I have some questions for Juanita. Here we go. Juanita. The community acknowledges the command you have of your voice and your commitment to the vocal arts at Chautauqua. Question, while growing up, did your family have a commitment to music? Absolutely. My mother was a classical pianist. And she tried to teach me to play the piano because she taught piano lessons. And it didn't like trying to teach your wife to drive a car. <laughs> And so she handed me over to a friend of hers who was a pianist, and this friend handed her two daughters over to my mother because she'd been trying to teach them to play. But um, at, at one point I had decided there are a couple of things I still play on the piano. I'm not a public pianist, but uh, in the garden is one I play all the time to keep my fingers moving. Now at 84, it's kind of hard to keep everything working. And so I do that. But um, my family has a, had a commitment. What about your dad? My dad sang when the quartets were the thing. That's been quite a while ago. He was a member of a quartet. Mother always had a um, group of young people singing in a choral group and kept a lot of us off the street. And, we were better children because we grew up with music. Talk about your family. What, who were you, what siblings did you have? One brother. One brother? We were just the two of us. My, um, he spent a career in the Army. He's gone on to heaven now. And he was a year and a half older than I am. Than I am. <laughs> and... My grandmother was Irish, off the boat Irish. My grandfather was a mixture of American Indian 
and African. And so I always check other when I have, <laughs> I said somebody can figure out what I am, right? My father's name was William James Wallace. Those of you who know history know that name. And I said, they named him that for some reason. And I didn't know his parents because they died when he was five and that was long before I was even in his eyes. And so it, it was some, some reason, and I don't know, I don't know why. My brother was overseas. He married a Japanese girl. My daughter married a German Catholic. Our son married, I guess she was a British something or another, wasn't she? <laughs> so when we get a picture taken of our family, we look like the United Nations. <laughs> So, did you go nuts watching the movie Braveheart with William Wallace and all of that? My gosh. No, I didn't. You didn't. Okay, well, we'll show that next. <laughs> uh, another quite follow up question to what uh, uh, Jerry asked was when did you realize you had a strong voice? When so, I was five years old. You could blow right out there. And I never had to sing with a, a microphone because I, I was trained. I've always had um, a coach on the side, a voice coach. I decided my second year in college that I was not going to major in music because I wanted to be able to eat and to live and so forth. And you had to be in the right place at the right time in those days to make a career. And in the paper in Cincinnati, I had a concert at, um, when I was still in high school. And the reporter who covered it said that this voice was the second Marian Anderson. And maybe that's when I realized that I had a voice, because I've been singing since then. Where were you born? Cincinnati, Ohio. So you really are a uh, true blue Cincinnati Reds type person. I don't know about the Reds, but I, <laughs> I else, What else is there in Cincinnati? <laughs> <laughs> but I was born in Cincinnati. Both of my children were born in Cincinnati. Um, I finished the University of Cincinnati and um, met my second husband in Cincinnati. So it's a special place for me. You, you, we've talked in the past, uh, this, uh, this whole interview may go all over the place, but your, your paths in Cincinnati crossed with Fred Shuttlesworth. Yes. And tell me about him. I mean, he was a major civil rights uh, individual. He lived not far from where our house was. When he, he came back to Cincinnati and uh, he took over a church out in that area. But... I was not a member of that church, but I knew him as a result of having him come back. Was at the time, of course he was a little bit older at the time, so this was sort of the, uh, was he still an activist in a sense? Was he still have that yes. vim and vigor and fire? Yes, yes. Yeah. And it was, um, had to be in the, when did I meet you, John? 64. So it had to be in the, in the early 60s. So what drew you to John? Oh. <laughs> 54. What was going on in 1954? Not 54. 64. 64. Oh, 64. 64. So what, what, what? Well, I had been, my first husband had been appointed um, head of security down for the island St. Croix. And so we moved down there. I waited until the children were out of school. And we were crossing. We had to change our flight in Washington. And we flew over when Martin Luther King was having his march on, his yep. gathering there for his uh, I Have a Dream speech. And so I'll never forget that combination. But, um, oh, so your question was? John Jackson, do you know him? Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> take a look, take a look. Raise your hand, John. <laughs> This is like memory garden here. <laughs> right. 
I come to the garden alone. <laughs> Our marriage was not working out, and so I left down there, took the children and came back to this country. And the school system gave me my job back. And uh, my house was, I had leased it out to a minister, and he had a daughter who had just had a baby, and I couldn't, I didn't want to disrupt them. So I took an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, on a road, a street, rather, a very short street, where they were just integrating. And um, there were four apartments in this building at the end of the street, and they each had two bedrooms. And so that's what I needed for my children. So I went in there. <laughs> and enjoyed it very much. He was very careful and he loved to go and brag about me because I was a teacher. And he said, oh, she's a teacher. So he was successful in renting out his apartment to somebody decent. Well, there was a woman he rented out to downstairs under me who at 3.30 in the morning had men knocking on the door <laughs> and open the door. And so um, I complained to him. I said, uh, I wish you had been as careful with her as you were with me. And one day I looked down and the truck had pulled up to take the furniture out that she had because she had not paid for the furniture. She left owing the man rent. And um, that was that. And so. I said, okay, it's empty now. Be careful this time. And <laughs> that one day I saw them in there cleaning it up, and I said, uh-oh, <laughs> must have rented this out to somebody. <laughs> and I heard somebody moving in down there, and um, he, the man who owned the building apologized to me and said it's a single man. He doesn't have a family, but he's a very nice person. He's an engineer at General Electric. So I said, why are you telling me this? <laughs> I found out later that the man who moved in had some second thoughts about being refused. And he was traveling somewhere down in... Um, Kentucky on his way to see family and he thought now I'm not going to be discriminated against because I'm not married I've been discriminated against because of my race but the, I'm not going to do this and he called and he told the man those words and the man said all right all right and let him rent the, the house the apartment down under me and then he came to me very quickly and apologized to me. He said, I I'm sorry, but uh, it, this is a nice man. You won't have the same problems that you had with this woman down there. And so he moved in, and he had been living right down the street in a one-bedroom apartment. I didn't know that, because I, you just didn't know people who were living in all these things. So he, uh, he moved in. His father came to visit, and I met his father, and then uh, he got to be a very good friend with my children. And he can tell you about <laughs> how we met. I was coming in after I got back there. Everybody wanted to throw a party because I had come back from the Virgin Islands. And so <laughs> he, <laughs> you want to tell him, John? Well, they had been trying to keep me out of the apartment because they wanted to be very careful and they thought they'd be better with a couple. And then I persuaded them to interview me and they decided, okay, he's probably low risk. Because this woman upstairs has been such a complainer about <laughs> <laughs> So I move in, my bedroom's right over the garage that we share, and she's coming in at 2, 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, now we hear it. <laughs> John, it was voice lessons. Uh, <laughs> well, you've got a story that goes with that one, too. <laughs> that comes much later, after we've been married a number of years. Anyway, we met, we shared a garage, and 
uh, I was working on my car, and this is documented in one of the books you brought. I was working on my car, and this woman drives in, and I never could get that car to work again. I was very much distracted. I put the spark plugs in wrong. I, had the wrong. I finally had to sell the car. I just couldn't <laughs> She was very much a distraction, and uh, that was the beginning of our relationship. Well, let me read it. It's very articulately done here in the book. Their cars were parked on the same side of the garage. One day, John was working on his car, and, quote, she came through. I put the spark plugs in upside down. I got the wires crossed. It was such a mess. She really shook me up. He never got that car to run, jokes Juanita. I could really wear a shift then. I don't I guess. So, anyways, the rest. Um, this book, which uh, in my time, Making the Most of the Rest of Your Life, and the author refers to John and Juanita Jackson as a, a true love story. And one of the things in the book, the uh, quote that, you're, uh, that you often used apparently was, uh, you used the expression, hard times will make a monkey eat red peppers. Help me through that. I've never heard that. What's that mean? <laughs> Did I say that? It's in the book. I'll have to get her. One day, <laughs> Juanita, let me read it. One day, Juanita used the expression, Hard times will make a monkey eat red peppers. John was stunned. Help me through the rest of the story. <laughs> that must have been something that my grandmother said to me. When your she... Father. Say what? It was your father. My father said that? I was quoting him? Yeah. Well, grandmother, because I didn't look like her children, she would pat me on the head if she was combing my hair and said, Poor little ugly thing. I don't know what's going to ever happen to you. But I've been praying that she's been up there watching me all these years. <laughs> <laughs> but it kept my feet on the ground. Uh, well, that's like Eleanor Roosevelt. Like Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> so you get married and the rest is history. Now, what, just out of curiosity, what brought you to Chautauqua Institution? Well, I just happened to have a picture here of the person who told us about Chautauqua. You got Polly got shocked. We all lived in Albany at the time. And uh, she started talking to me about Chautauqua. She says, um, Nathan goes all around the country auditioning young people and they come here to uh, get scholarships to come here and perform. And, oh, and there's some other things that go on in Chautauqua. They have a choir and an orchestra and a this and that. And she said, you should come and visit us. I think you'd like it. I kept that phrase alive. I always said that to her, because the first time we came, we stayed with them in their apartment. And for a weekend. The next year we came back <laughs> and stayed a long weekend. Then we came back and stayed a week. And then we came back the next year and stayed two weeks. And finally, we <laughs> we'd have to rent a place, you see. And so here's a picture of them visiting us at a house that we had rented down on Miller Park. And I'll have this over there so you can see it when you're up close. But when they started doing the practice shacks over, we redid one for Polly and Nathan Gottschalk for introducing us to Chautauqua. And we had a, an interesting time with it because they had our name really big. Don't go there. Don't go there. Okay, I won't go there and had their names real small. I said, no, that's not what it's about. It's about them, not about us. But at any rate, they, they changed it for a couple of times and got it right. But Polly came back. He, he had died when she came back when that happened. But she came back 
who had a big ceremony over there where they were doing all the houses. And you can look through these. There's a band, a group playing. And it's just it's really very interesting. But we thank Polly and Nathan for introducing us to Chautauqua. And then, of course, we introduced our kids to Chautauqua. And we've been coming back ever since. And then when it was time, John had retired, and we decided, OK, this is where we wanted to retire. So here we are. We have had five generations here. That's true. Mm -hmm. children, and a great grandson, and the great grandson's picture is over. No, he's over there. Great grandson. Mm -hmm. He'll be he'll be two years old, three years old. He'll be three in April. Juanita, what does Professor Horace Clarence Boyer mean to you? He has a place in my heart because. During the Civil War, there was a lot of music that went on. And he and I had the responsibility at 2 o'clock for doing music of the Civil War. He has since gone on to heaven, too. But he used to come and direct the choir, the choir through some things. But um, he <coughs> would play music. And there's a book here with his picture, our pictures in it that there's a large book where the, somebody in the country did something about uh, unique places to live. And one of the things, Chautauqua was one of them, and one of the things that they uh, lit up there was the fact that we had performed. So you can look through that book when you, um, it's over on that table. In this particular book, they talk a little bit about how you uh, interpreted the spiritual as a historical text. And such as the, the one we've often heard and played, certainly uh, uh, Chautauqua School plays it uh, and does it, uh, Follow the Drinking Gourd. Uh, do, you, do you remember much about that, the historical context of that song? Yeah. I don't even know that song. Oh, well, it's only in the book. Come on. What? Basically, it was from the slaves were finding their way north, and the drinking gourd was the big dipper. Uh, so that was why they were, that was an expression, and then it became a song. There we go. But I don't try to preserve that one. Okay. All right. <laughs> this book further says, because this book's a fount of knowledge on both of you. I'll just focus in on you, though, for right now. Uh, sometimes Juanita performs on Mother Nature stage on Easter at dawn, you always sing something special. What is it? Easter morning sunrise service in one of the national parks in Washington. For years, I was up there singing. And I would sing an Easter song. You know, Were You There? Or Sweet Little Jesus Boy? But I didn't sing Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. <laughs> well, that's why you married John. You didn't have to. No, I didn't have any trouble. <laughs> As you've been up here, though, one of the things that you and John have done, and done incredibly well, is to put the spiritual in, in the historical context and, and also bring meaning to it. When did you start doing that type of educational programming? It was 80, somewhere around 82. A friend asked me to come over to her church and sing a couple of spirituals and talk about them for her Sunday school class. I did that two years running, and then I started to develop it into a presentation. And I, I left the, the opera and all the, I still do one foreign language, which I love. What's that? Umbra my You recognize that? Okay, that That's the last song that is played on Sunday night in the amphitheater at the end of the service. And in fact, um, we had a special event here on a Tuesday night about that song. Remember? And Beth Archibald played the, org the um, 
violin and I sang that particular song. How did the Civil Rights Movement affect you, either directly, indirectly, you certainly you, you talk about its roots, but during that time period, the 50s, 60s, did this have an impact on you personally? It did not, because I did not have the experiences that, uh, I didn't live in the South, mm -hmm. and um, I did not experience the things that a lot of people did. Was there much going on at all in the Cincinnati area? Is that, was that? Well, I was between Cincinnati and Harlan County, Kentucky, and then Akron, Ohio, where my father went because of December 7th, 41. We moved there in 42. And so I was always a minority in a situation. I, my experience was like that. In high school, where I finished Akron, Ohio, I was one of maybe 12 or 14 persons of color, and I was um, senior attendant to the homecoming queen. Now that had nothing to do with the color of my skin. It must have been because I was singing. And I had, uh, um, it, w it was a wonderful experience. I sang a solo for graduation. There were two of us who went off to get this evaluation of the, of the voice, and the head of the glee club said, okay, now whichever one of you gets, a, um, gets the higher evaluation will sing the solo. We both got the highest evaluation. So we both sang solo, and I did. I stood on the River of Jordan, and she sang I, I thought I would never forget it, but I'm not going to remember it right now. I'll call you at 2 o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> you, you'll, you'll hear, you'll, my wife will answer. <laughs> I won't. Uh, you're, we know you're a classically trained uh, vocalist, and you studied voice with the late Louis John. 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 So tell me about him. How did you, how did you, how did you seek him out, and when did, where did that occur? That occurred right after my daughter was born, and there, there was another woman. She and I were the only two who could not get into the conservatory because it was not a part of the university then, and they did not accept people of color. And she was a marvelous soprano, and so we got referred to Louis John Johnan. And he was a marvelous, marvelous instructor. And he got me going. What was the technique that he had that was distinctive, that really made a difference to you? That tipping point said, aha, you taught me this, now I'm that much better. Well, I was just starting to sing in German when he had a heart attack. But he was taking me right along with the languages. And uh, I had to get it going here so I could get it up and get it out, breathing. And he was, he, was, he was particular in what he wanted to get from you, how he wanted you to get it out. And he did, um, I was very pleased and very proud. And then uh, years later, I studied with, um, I studied in, um, outside of Washington. Where did I go, John? <laughs> Into Maryland, the, uh, a friend who continues to be a friend. Of That's you. true. Into she, Maryland, and you regularly took lessons there. Yeah, she was a soprano, a well-known soprano. And uh, she, we still are in touch because she wants to know, am I still singing? <laughs> and um, there was another person. Oh, goodness gracious. I had all those things ready so I could just pull them right out, right? Oh, here we go. Nancy Marriott. A soprano. She's the Marriott family, the hotel people. She's married to one of the brothers. 
but, and I'm still on her mailing list because she and I studied with Louis John Johnan, and um, she's still giving concerts too. Still singing. When somebody asks you uh, to put on a performance, and they just say, "What would you know? What, what would be your favorite kind of playlist? A set that's more uh, of songs that you like to do? If it was solely on your own to just to do an hour-long performance, and you knew you had to." have six, seven songs that you had to sing, what would they be? Six or seven. Five or t four or five, two or three, I don't care what, you know. Like a concert I do, yeah, like yeah, yeah. 14 songs. 14 songs, yeah. But there's got to be some which are your signature songs. The ones you know you're going to knock them dead. <laughs> well, I have a program here somewhere. Because <laughs> I... I usually start out, here's one of the programs. With having my accompanist play Bomb in Gilead, and it has me in tears and gets everybody in the mood. And then, I recite a poem by Langston Hughes, Mother to Son. And I'll sing, I've been in the storm so long. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Poor me, have you ever heard that one? Poor me, poor me, trouble will bury me down. I'm in tears when I start singing because I've been going with Balm and Gilead. And then I perk up and do Swing Low Sweet Chariot. I always include that. Precious Lord, take my hand. Were you there? Every time I feel the spirit. Oh, wasn't that a wide river? Deep river. Have you heard me do Deep River? because I did that down at uh, uh, the Covenant, First Covenant. No hiding place down there. On my journey. On my journey now, Mount Zion. My journey now, Mount Zion. Well, I wouldn't take a nothing, Mount Zion, for my journey now, Mount Zion. And I'll end up with, I want Jesus to walk with me and ride on King Jesus. And most of those are in every concert that I do. I don't repeat absolutely everything in there. Did you go to my concert down at the Jackson Center? Yes. Is that a general question for me or? Yes. <laughs> this is a press release for the Jackson Center concert. And it was a benefit for the Jackson Center and, the, and our chapter of the NSAL. But uh, it has their mission down here and the mission of our NSAL. It doesn't say much about the woman who sang. <laughs> Everybody knew her. <laughs> if I may, I think we should include a bit of mischief that she engages in in her, some of her concerts. She doesn't put every piece on the program. <coughs> where people don't know her. And she will sit on the front pew if it's a church or in the front row if it's a place where, like this, where we have chairs. And some poor innocent soul may be sitting next to her. And she starts her concert rather dramatically. What's the first word, John? <laughs> After the accompanist has been playing Bomb in Gilead, and people are waiting for what's going to happen next. Lord, how come? 
from me I don't want to mess up this. That's okay. We'll you when you started the concert, Go ahead. That are still in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Once I was motivated to, to stay down there in, in the front row and do it that do it. And it was so effective, I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> Lord, how come me here? Lord, how come me here? But then I go on up on stage. Yeah. Then I start singing. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I, I get so much into, my, into the words and to the music that I, I'm in tears, full tears, when I'm doing those. And I'm feeling it here. And I have one special one that I do now that um, drives my husband crazy. Somebody walk in, oh, Juanita, how are you? I say, here I am, Lord. <laughs> but we were in a, a big, we were seeing a doctor over in uh, Warren, and it was a huge waiting room and about five doctors. So each door had a nurse who'd come to the door and call a name. And I waited and waited and finally came to the door and called Juanita Wallace Jackson. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> and my poor husband, I felt sorry for <laughs> I didn't plan to do that. It just comes up, comes out. Well, you've been in many spots where I've seen you ex Perennially uh, explode into a song. It's it's terrific. <laughs> oh, down at the Jackson yeah, Center. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do that because everybody's talking and they're trying to get their attention. And uh, who was it? They're trying to quiet everybody. And so I start, Kumbaya, my Lord. And they all joined in, and started singing. Everybody got quiet. <laughs> And uh, the fella thanked me <laughs> for getting their attention. <laughs> As an alto soloist, you've been involved in Handel's Messiah, Vivaldi's Gloria, Mozart's Coronation Mass, among other things. Uh, ever thought about doing any sort of uh, more pop songs? Have you ever thought Motown? Have you ever thought just kind of getting out of the genre that which you're, you're known as. Have you ever done that? That's not where I'm coming from. Yeah. Does it ever the, wake up in the morning and say, I'll give it a shot? Mm-mm. Kind of an Aretha Franklin moment? That's <laughs> not where I'm coming from. Okay. I'm very thankful and appreciative that God's still letting me stand and sing, and I'll sing his praises. That's where I am. How many of you were at our concert Sunday? We had one song that, um, come on along and listen to the lullaby of Broadway. Now that's as close as I got. Because <laughs> all the rest of, we were all, the core group was singing that. I have to work at it though. We met through the daughter of the state of the Episcopal College. And Debbie Phillippe, who was the hostess, would sneak Juanita's granddaughters in so they were slept in the living room because children were not allowed to stay <laughs> at the Episcopal College. And they were told to wake up early before <laughs> breakfast and get into breakfast. <laughs> and we became quite friendly with Karen. And through Karen, we met her mom and John. And as a parent, as a <coughs> and as a friend, she is unexcelled. You can talk about her voice, and that can be tra trained, but as a human being, you don't get better, more loving, and more deeply caring 
that one either. You got something very special here on March 7th, 2015, which I bet nobody else has, is that there is now in the National Registry of Stars a star called the Juanita Wallace Jackson Musical Star. And you have a certificate to prove that. And I can't think of a person who's more worthy of receiving a star than one Juanita Jackson. My two children did that. Oh, that's cool. So that is really, that is really slight. So as we draw closure to this unbelievable interview, um, and you, somebody I was had to, in, this happens, I'm sure, where they want to introduce you. So they, they go to you and they say, Juanita, could you give us a little bit about you that would really get the crowd a good, strong feeling about you? What would you say? What would you hand to that person who was going to introduce you? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Beautiful. Juanita Jackson. <laughs>